Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Genesis chapter 1. If you take your Bible, join me in Genesis chapter number 1. It was in the early 80s, and I had my first car, which I have mentioned to you before. It was a 1969 Plymouth Barracuda. I was 16 years old. I had purchased the car for $125, and I was driving that vehicle, my 69 Cuda. I was driving apparently slightly faster than what had been agreed upon was the speed with which you should be traveling on that particular road. And up to this point, I had never had this phenomena happen while I was driving, and it was a little unsettling. And so I immediately pulled my 69 Barracuda off to the side of the road. The officer approached the vehicle, and I rolled down the window. Some of you may not know this, but before the buttons, there was actually this little crank on the side, and the window would go down. It was quite revolutionary. So I rolled down the window of my car, and there stood an officer of the law. And he said to me, a driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. So I immediately got my driver's license and I handed him my driver's license. And then I went to the glove box for the registration and the proof of insurance. And I got those and I'm about to hand them to the officer and he looked at me and now he had a little bit different look on his face as if an eyebrow were raised and he said, are you Jerry Redland's son? Now, how I was about to answer that was of extreme importance, okay? I, I could say, no, I've never heard of him and, and, and risk it, or I could say, yes, that is my father. So I was very respectful and I said, yes, sir, uh, that's my dad. And then he looked at me and he said with an inquisitive tone, your dad wouldn't be very happy if you brought home a ticket now, would he? I said, no, sir, he would not. Okay. I said, all right, slow it down. Yes, sir, I will. Okay. And he walked back to his patrol car, and I drove off in my $125 Plymouth Barracuda. When the officer asked me, he wouldn't be very happy if you came home with a ticket, now would he? What he was saying is, your dad wouldn't be very happy to learn that you were speeding in your vehicle. He's really not saying your dad wouldn't be happy that you'd have to pay the fine. He's not saying your dad wouldn't be happy that this would be an inconvenience for you. He's not saying your dad would not be very happy because this would just put you out of a convenience that you have come to enjoy. He's not saying any of those things. What the officer is saying at that very moment is your dad would not be very happy to know that you were not representing him and his name very well. And to that, I fully understood. And I said, no, sir, he would not. In Genesis chapter 2, we see almost parenthetically some of the ongoing aspects of what God did in his creative acts in Genesis chapter 1. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 20, we read this. The Bible says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help me for him. You say... What in the world does Genesis 2.20 have to do with God's creative acts in Genesis chapter 1? Well, what this tells us is that from all of God's creation in the animal world, 
There was not found anything that was created being of the same image as was Adam. There was something that God was trying to highlight for Adam that became painfully obvious. Here, God says, okay, Adam, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have all these animals pass before you and I want you to name the animals. Well, of course God wanted him to name the animals, but I think there may have even been a more profound reason for why God has Adam name the animals. They passed before him and Adam with a perfect intellect this is not a, oh, I don't know. Should it be? It's none of that. He just starts naming the animals. And, and as he does so, he sees that, that they are created in this fashion that there's one that completes the other. There's one that fits with the other. And in all of creation, Adam begins to understand there's, there's something that is yet missing and it has to do with me. And of all that Adam sees, there is nothing that is presented in front of him that was created in the image of God. Adam's the one that is over all of this creation. He's the one given the authority, the responsibility, the power, if you will, to name the animals. And yet his name was, was given to him by the one that has authority over him. And while the animals were subject now to him, he is subject to another. And while the animals were beautifully representative of God's creative power, they are not representative of God's creative character. Something is missing. They bore an image, but not like Adam. They did not bear the image of God. Today, the title of our message is Imago Dei, in the image of of God. Theologians rightly build powerful, impactful truths regarding mankind from this idea of the Imago Dei, the image of God. Your Bibles are open right now to Genesis chapter 1. I'd like you to look with your eyes on this passage of Scripture. Genesis 1, beginning in verse number 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. What are we finding from this book of beginnings, from this, this God-created section of Genesis? Well, the first thing that we're learning that we'll look at today is he uniquely created us. He uniquely created us. Now, I'm saying that uniquely created us as in distinction from all the rest of that which God created. You are not created in the same fashion as every other created thing. And Adam recognized that he's created in a different fashion than all the rest of what God had done. Unlike all the rest of creation, mankind is uniquely created. Instead of speaking man into existence, the Bible says the following, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
This man that God would create distinct from all the rest of creation. Remember that God filled the earth with plant life, with sea life, with animal life, hundreds, thousands, millions of created beings that all God has to do is speak and the word of his power, it immediately creates. But man is uniquely created. God now takes that which he has created and from his creation, God then creates man. This would be just one man, just then one woman. Remember in all the rest of creation, God fills the earth, but but now this man and this woman would be the first. And and from them, they would represent mankind. And and we would then come from them. They're now going to fill the earth. When the Bible says that God formed, in verse number seven, chapter two, the Lord God formed, it's the first use of the Hebrew word that we read as formed. It's a word that's used of a potter shaping the clay. It implies that God becomes directly involved in the shaping, the fashioning, not only of man's physical frame, but every part of his being. And he does so in a very personal way. I don't know if you've ever pictured this before, but God uses what we sometimes refer to as anthropomorphic. It means giving human features to God who is a spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth. But we get this picture of God who who is bent over his creation. He has lovingly and tenderly, like the potter who forms and fashions, moves the clay into a shape that's befitting the potter. We get this sense of God forming and fashioning mankind. And then how beautiful, how how touching, how, if you'll allow the word, how intimate that God bends over man and, He leans close to him and he breathes into man his breath. And mankind at this moment, his chest heaves and his eyes flutter. And at this moment, different from all the rest of creation, mankind becomes a living soul. I'm here to tell you today, you are uniquely created. There is nothing else in this created world that fills us with awe and wonder. There's nothing else that compares with the pinnacle of God's creation, the uniqueness with which he forms and fashions and breathes life into you. We find it interesting that we went from being dust to being the singular part of God's creation that is to reflect him, image bearers. You think about it. We had a beginning as dust and we went from dirt to imago Dei. From from that which God took from his creation and now he forms and fashions it into this image of God. Think about it. Whenever we use the word to, it implies that we're moving from one thing to another thing. We sometimes use the expression from A to Z. We went from having no children to having seven children. Probably not all at once, by the way, but we went from being a freshman to being a senior. We went from the crown center to my car. I went from being an enemy of God to being part of his family. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse number seven, Words that help me understand, to what end was I created? Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. To what end were you created? Campus Church, if you don't answer correctly this question, you stumble through life. And that's the truth. If you don't answer this question correctly, you are among the floundering masses of people that think that life exists for no greater purpose than to eat, to drink and have fun, be merry, because tomorrow I'm gonna die. To what end were you created? To what end? You were created 
to reflect his glory. This now gives me purpose, understanding, meaning, direction, an end. You and I were created to be the living image bearers, reflectors of our creator. All the rest of creation are a demonstration of his omnipotent power, his infinite wisdom, his limitless creativity. Yet only mankind, apart from all the rest of creation, can think about God. Only mankind can have fellowship with God, can have thoughts about eternity and life after death. Only man was created from something to something. You and I are God's only plan by which he desires his image to be seen. No other plan, no other image is to represent him. This is why God has such a strong condemnation regarding idols. In 2 Kings chapter 11, verse number 18. And all the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down, his altars and his images, same word, in the image of God created he him. They break down the altars and his images break they in pieces thoroughly. Same word, let us make man in our image. Why is it that God says, you shall have no other gods before me? Why is it that God says, you will make no graven image? Why? Because we already have the image. The image is supposed to be sitting next to you. The image is supposed to be walking around you. The image is supposed to be assembled here in a place that we call campus church. This is supposed to be the the distributed to the world image of God. Listen, Campus Church, listen, follower of Jesus Christ, listen, believer, listen, mankind. We are uniquely created. There's nothing else in all the world that is supposed to point us to God like you and like me. This is how God has uniquely created you in his image, sharing his likeness, not in your body, but in your capacity for morality for spirituality, for creativity, for love. Yes, he uniquely created you. Well, he's not only uniquely created us, he he goes beyond this. He has unashamedly crowned us. He did, yeah, I know, it's a unique creation. We're, We're the image bearers. But then he goes beyond this. And now not only has he uniquely created us, he has unashamedly crowned us. He's not embarrassed. He's not like, well, I I sure hope this works. No, God, without embarrassment, with, with an unashamed focus on that which he says is good, God has uniquely crowned us, unashamedly so. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. This again is the crowning achievement that God performed on the sixth day. Notice how the psalmist mentions this. He's talking about God's creative acts. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him, this is mankind, a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. One commentary stated, nowhere is man's dignity asserted more clearly and more boldly than in this passage. Of all that God has created, man stands as his crowning act, his final and highest creative act, and all that God performed, again, in just six literal days of creation. No other aspect of God's creation shares the Imago Dei, This is reserved for mankind exclusively. It is man's crown to wear. And we might add, this is why all of mankind has value and is to be treated with dignity and respect. It is why every person of every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every tone of skin, every form of face, every shape of our eyes or ears or nose or mouth or chin, every color or curl of our hair, every stature, every intellect, every athletic ability, every mental state, every musical gift, every verbal ability or lack thereof, all are to be treated with value, with dignity, 
with respect because of all mankind and mankind exclusively bears the imago Dei, the image of God. There is no other man-made religious system that values all of mankind as does the true and living way found in the pages of the book you hold in your lap. Do you know what Christianity tells us? It tells us though it is often marred, it is oftentimes incredibly blurred, it is sadly sometimes difficult to see, but every living, breathing human being is created to bear the image of God. And it is why every living, breathing human being from the womb to the tomb is to be treated with the utmost dignity and respect because we bear the image of almighty God. We should note that while we celebrate every station of man, we do not celebrate every sin of man. Today, there are many that want not only to personally and publicly celebrate their sin, which mars the image of God, but also are demanding that you celebrate it too. No, we are to respect every man from sinner to saint, but not respect or celebrate their sin. We do well to acknowledge that God's original image in mankind is marred, but it is not lost. And it should be recognized as universally present in all of mankind. This means that every human being is to be treated with dignity and respect. And those who are image bearers as those who are image bearers of almighty God. But again, this does not mean that we celebrate their sin. And as image bearers and as God's crowning work of creation, we see that God places a premium on all human life. It's why he forbids murder. It's why, again, abortion is wrong. In Genesis chapter 9, verse number 6, of course, we're not there in our study yet, but to just jump ahead and borrow from Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. Why is it that we value life? Because you exclusively are made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. This last week, I I received some communication from a person who asked a good question. And it's oftentimes clouded with emotion. And it can become difficult for us to process, what do I really believe? What do I think about this truth? They asked a question that had to do with a longtime family pet. They'd had the pet for a lot of years. I've, I, I've met the dog. I know it well. It's a beautiful, big dog. And it became seriously incapacitated, very ill. Extended in years. And, and uh, the husband took the dog and put the dog down. And she asked the question, do we have a right to do so? And I know, I know she's, she's typing these words with, with eyes that are filled with tears. She said, as as believers, do we have a right to do so? And I'll tell you why. Because she looked at this dog like David um, heard when Nathan the prophet came and and told the story about the man that had the little sheep and, and it laid in his lap and it ate from his hand and it was like a daughter to him and the neighbor took it and killed it and served the lamb to a traveling friend. And David was incensed because David understands that was part of his family. So she's writing it like this was part of our family. So do you have the right to to put down the the family dog? I'm not being silly about this. And to some it would mean very little and to some it would mean a great deal. And the answer is yes, you do have the right to do so. You say, well, well, what makes it right for us to do that but but not to show some some, what, what, what many would call some act of kindness to, to help someone else who is struggling physically. Because God put you in the place of dominion over all the world except for others like you. God, res, God has reserved that right for himself exclusively. So while, while we can put down the family dog, 
or we can put down cattle for sustenance, for, for food, for, for people. We, we do not have the right to do that to one another because that is reserved for God because you exclusively are made as his crowning achievement, unashamedly so. And that right belongs exclusively to God. While the Bible, just to, to wrap up this loop regarding animals, while the Bible forbids cruelty to animals, it doesn't teach equality with animals. They are underneath our rule you have dominion over. Yes, God has unashamedly crowned us. He has uniquely created us. But because he's crowned us, unashamedly so, that also comes with what we're gonna call this universal commission. He has universally commissioned us. That means God has a job for you for me to do. Sometimes we refer to Genesis chapter one, verse number 28, as what we call the, the creation mandate. I hope you've heard those, those terms, the creation mandate. That means, wow, when God created, he also gave us a commissioning, a mandate. These are the must do's for my creation. This is the intent for which I have created you. Genesis 1, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Do you know what God is commissioning us, telling us to do? Well, the first thing he's telling us to do is, hey, here's what you are. You're supposed to be a ruler, you are to rule over my work of creation. Again, he blessed, he said, rule over, subdue it, have dominion over it. Now, we've oftentimes taken two extremes when it comes to this aspect of God's created purpose. Sadly, many have either wasted the creation or worshiped the creation. And neither of those are correct. Listen, just because you get to rule over it doesn't mean that you're to waste the creation. Sometimes I think we're a little bit cavalier with our, well, you know, we're the rulers over creation so we can do what we want. Well, that's foolish. You and I really should say, how can we best steward that which has been entrusted to us? Now, don't take that to the point of worship. Don't take that to the point of, oh, well, well, we have to do whatever we can to protect Mother Earth. No, we believe in Father God who has called you to rule over his creation. But don't, don't worship it and don't waste it. So what's he called us to do? This universal commission to be a ruler. He's also called you to be a reproducer. A reproducer. Now, clearly there are those that are going to fit outside of what we would say this, this universal commissioning. Uh, some people have a womb that God's never opened. Some people God's blessed with the unique gift of singleness or has them in a state or a time or a period of singleness. So we would understand that, but you know the normal aspect of God's created world, the mandate that is generally ours for all people, places and times, not only to be rulers, but also to be reproducers. God created man in his own image, image of God created he, him. And then notice male and female created he, them. That's essential to fulfill the created mandate. Again, we remember that we're called to be fruitful and multiply. Now, just as the image of God is essential to who we are, male or female is essential to what we are. Scripture tells us that God created gender differences demonstrated only by male and female. God left no other alternatives. There are no other options. These genders are assigned at birth. And throughout his creation, God purposefully noted distinct differences in what he made. And he culminated these distinctions in male and female genders. He said, well, what are you talking about? All through creation, God took pains to make distinctions, to say it's this and this, this and this. He, he makes these separations and then he crowns it with male and female. For example, God separated light from darkness. 
day and night, evening and morning, waters from the heavens, land and sea, plants and trees after their kinds. In other words, these are all uniquely distinct. Fish, birds, animals after their kind, all uniquely distinct. God defines each of his acts of creation as good. Then he said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will create for him and help me, a completer. And the, the answer to man's loneliness was singularly found. In his answer, I'll create and help me, God created a woman. We should note that part of what we call as the creation mandate was to be a reproducer. And if this is our mandate, it must also be noted that it is impossible to accomplish outside of God's plan that is only possible in that which God uniquely, specifically, with detail pronounces as good. God could have done whatever he chose regarding this matter of be fruitful and multiply. God could have created two men. He could have created two men to be fruitful and multiply. He could have created two women to be fruitful and multiply, but he did not do so. And so God's plan was purposefully presented as the crowning act of creation, as, as the, the, the final distinct aspect of separation, male and female, And then he said, be fruitful and multiply. What did God create us to do in this universal commissioning? Well, he created us to be a ruler. He created us to be a reproducer. And then back really to where we started. He created us to what we have called again this Imago Dei. To reflect his image. God created us to be reflectors. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Colossians chapter three, verse number 10 says this. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the, here it is, image of him that created him. He says, okay, you were created with a purpose. Sin has radically marred that purpose. You're not able to do right now because of sin, what you were created to do. This Imago Dei is, it's difficult to see. Jesus Christ comes and now he is doing something new. It goes from one to another. It was this, but now it's this. And God continues to do that work of making that which doesn't do what it's supposed to do, able to do what it's supposed to do. And that is more clearly bear the Imago Dei, the image of God. When Adam and Eve fell, the image of God in them was tarnished, but not entirely eradicated. And all men, both saved and lost, are image bearers, some to a greater degree than others, but all are created as image bearers of their creator. It's why when Christ now comes, he fulfills something in me that can be accomplished through no other means. And now that image of God more clearly, distinctly seen. Think for a moment about how we were created in his likeness. You have creativity. God created, he made. This activity involves imagination, the ability to think in conceptual terms. Man being made in the image of God can also make things, not to the same degree that God does. For man can't make things out of nothing, yet man can compose a symphony, design a computer, paint a picture. An animal cannot do this. Man was originally designed to use his creativity for God as reflectors of him. Communication, in Genesis 1, the Bible tells us that God speaks and so does man. Man is the only creature that can talk. Animals can make sounds, but they do not communicate the specificity of, of thoughts and ideas through verbalizing. Man was originally created to communicate in fellowship with God. C- communion, you and I were made for fellowship. We see this in our desire to interact with one another. But most importantly, we were made for fellowship with God. This is what obligates us to become Christians and follow a Christian way of life. And then morality. This may be the most powerful argument for being made in his image. In Genesis 1, God pronounces things to be good. God is a moral being and man shares that character as well. Man has the faculty of distinguishing between good and evil. All men in every society have some sense of right and wrong, which is not found in the animal kingdom. So only man has the ability to reflect his characteristics in moral fashion. 
that separates us from all the rest of God's creation. God is holy. He's, he then tells us, be ye holy, for I am holy. God is good, so we are to be good. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. God is love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The perfect reflection of the Father was whom? Do you remember when Jesus told Philip these words? Have I been so long with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Paul reminds us, just as a person who saw Christ could see the Father, we too are to follow that pattern. In other words, if a person has seen you, there are to also be seen some aspects of Jesus. It's actually him that you and I have put on. Christ, the image of the invisible God. And, and we are called to be the image of Christ. To show Christ. It is our daily privilege and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. As we conclude, we remember that God has uniquely created us. You are uniquely created. You are unashamedly crowned and you are universally commissioned. All of this has to do with purpose. God created you with a purpose. Do you understand the significance of this purpose. It gives you meaning, the potential for fulfillment, and an opportunity to do what you were created to do. Church, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, it is time for us to reclaim the purpose for which we were created, to show to a watching world the Imago Dei, the very image of God. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord. I'm so thankful for many faithful viewers like you who watch Rejoice in the Lord each week as we study the Word of God and sing His praises. You know, often we hear that the music on Rejoice encourages and inspires. And I'm happy to tell you that we've selected several songs featured over the past 12 months to produce 2023's best musical moments. For your gift of $70 or more to Rejoice, we'll send you the DVD and companion CD of 2023's Best Musical Moments, and your gift will help keep Rejoice in the Lord on the air. Call, write, or go online today and request 2023's Best Musical Moments.